I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Alexander White. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being part of this. Why don't you start, Dr. White, and share with us just a little bit of your background, your, your upbringing. Okay, thank you. Well, my name is Alexander B. White. The B, my initial, is my previous name, which is a Polish name, difficult to pronounce. It's Biały Włos, that means white hair. So when I came to the States, no one could pronounce my name. So I thought, well, I will cut off the hair and I'll be white. It's easy to do. So that's my name. I was born in southern Poland in a small town called Krosno, K-R-O-S-N-O, within about 20 minutes from the Czechoslovak border on the Slovak side, in other words, more eastward. It had about 15 to 18,000 population, most of it Roman Catholic, and there were about 2,400, 2,500 Jewish families. And anyway, we lived in this town and my grandfather on my mother's side established the business, a glazing, glass beveling, mirror making, framing, that business. He was very handy because he was born in a Ukrainian village where they used to make all kinds of canes, decorated canes. So he could make all of that stuff. During World War I, you couldn't get glass. So he had a son and a daughter, and he sent them to Bohemia, where there were lots of glass. And they sent glass to Krosno, to our town. And that's how he got into the glazing business. His son took it over, and when my dad met my mom, who was the daughter of my grandfather, uh, he was taken into the business. Of course, he was a Talmudical scholar. He had nothing to do with it, but he learned very fast. He loved to work. A ghetto in my town, Krosno, was not established until late. Uh, we already heard about ghettos in Krakow, Warsaw, in December of 1941, when the German armies were already in Moscow. But it didn't. We knew it's going to come to us, but it didn't come to us until August uh, 1942. What happened to us is. Uh, we were ordered, first of all, to get together enough money, the Jewish community, by the Gestapo, that if we will give them enough money in kind, gold, uh, diamonds, etc., etc., they will postpone the verdict of, of the so-called uh, Umsiedlung, resettlement action. And I remember my dad and my mom and Jews went around to everybody getting gold watches, anything else, give it to them. They gave it to them. And they postponed it for a week. A week later, they said they ordered all Jews, regardless of age, to show up near the railroad station where there was a cattle market place. It was called Targovica. Everybody has to show up there for so-called resettlement. Now, we already heard what resettlement meant. It meant a resettlement to Belzitz, which is an extermination camp, you know. So there was chaos. So anyway, we were in the ghetto. Since we were important for the economy, 
we were sent to that ghetto, and we stayed in that ghetto until 19, uh, December 1942. December 3rd, 1942, we came back from our shop, which is now owned by a German, and we found out that there is an order that the town is going to remain free of Jews. We all have to show up Friday, December 4th. Now, we knew that that's going to be the end. So we slipped out of the ghetto, and we went to our shop, which was only about a street away, and there was a basement, and we hid in that basement. And there was my dad, I was there, and my little brother, who was by now 11 years old, and a relative of ours, Mr. Heller, with his wife Rachel, 22 years old, and two babies. And we sat there the entire night in the winter. Early in the morning, we didn't know what to do. So my relatives said, why don't I take some tools, go on the street, see what goes on. He went on the street, he came right back. And he tells us that this little ghetto is surrounded with machine guns. And we knew that there was no way out. We waited for the ethnic German to open the store. And we heard him open the store, we crawled out. And he says, well, what are you doing here? With babies in the winter? He played as he didn't know what was going on. I have a feeling he knew. And he says, you cannot stay here, but I will go into the ghetto and find out from them whether we are staying in town or not. We stayed in town during the first resettlement. So maybe we are staying now also in town. Anyway, he comes back with the Gestapo man. I happen to know every one of them because they used to come to our shop for all kinds of things. And he says, take your stuff, come with me into the ghetto. So we walked with him in the ghetto. The people were already all lined up there. There were already corpses lying on the ground that were shot for whatever reason. Maybe they came late, or maybe they were hidden, or whatever not. And he told us to line up with the others. We lined up. Then he tells me I should go into the, uh, our apartment. We didn't have an apartment. We, we lived in the kitchen of my uncle's uh, little house, who was now in Siberia. So we used this kitchen. Anyway, I took out some items, lined up with the others. And to make a long story short, they, Schmatzler, who was the head of the Gestapo in Krostow, Hauptsturmführer, Schwarzler comes over to my dad and he says, you and me and the, my relative, Mr. Heller, and a cousin of mine, David, we are going to go to the air base in our town, the German air base, and we are going to work for the German Luftwaffe. But we cannot take uh, my brother, who was 11, and David cannot take his little boy, Michael, who was five years old, and my uh, relative couldn't take Rachel with the two babies. We cried, we begged him, yeah, I can't, but I promise you, he said, they are not going to go up there. They are going to go to a larger ghetto in the Reichshof, in Polish, it was called Zeshov, which is not far from our town. And he said, they are going to be there, they're going to work there, and you will be able to communicate with them anyway. We cried, it didn't work. And they marched them out of the uh, ghetto. Within a minute or two, a Gestapo man brings back Rachel with the two babies in arms, has a stand here, shoots her, shoots the two babies. Only yards away from me. 
Then some people coming down from the attics where they were hidden in the ghetto, they went straight against the wall and they were shot. And we, they were sent to Zeshev and we were sent to the air base. And we are at their base. We were there the entire year of 1943. And we were treated very decently, very nicely. We were safer than in the ghetto. But at the end of 1943, there was the order from the Gestapo, Jews are not supposed to be anywhere but in the concentration camp. So they took us out of the air base through a concentration camp called Shevne, which was a prison of war camp for Soviet prisoners of war. They shot all of them and they put us in there to clean up after them. And then they sent us to Krakow, Płaszów concentration camp. We arrived there January 1st, the first week of January 1944. So we were there. We were put into work with glazers and painters there. And I was assigned with my dad to glaze a barrack that was outside the inner perimeter of the camp but it was where the guards used to live and their families and so on. So my dad and I were in that barrack. While we were there, a guard from a barrack across showed me a small loaf of bread. I didn't know whether he wants to give it to me or he wants me to sell it to me. So I crossed over to pick it up and I see a assessment, follow me. Oh, that was bad. Well, I, the guard also saw the assessment. So as I come into the barrack where the guard was, the guard tells me, get under my bunk. I should hide un under his bunk. So I got under his bunk. He went up a ladder where he had hay or whatever, uh, he wasn't there. The guard comes in. The, the uh, prisoners had nicknames for guards. They called him in Polish Niedźwiecz, which means bear, because he was a big guy. They walked like a bear. The bear bends down. He sees me under. He takes his rib over. He says, stick your head out. Well, uh, I had no choice. That moment I was thinking of my dad. My dad probably saw it through the window. And I bet you he was scared to death. So, but I stuck my head out. Then he takes his revolver, puts it back in the whole thing, said, Shah de the Kugel, a waste of a bullet. It's a waste of a bullet. He has me crawl out of there beat the heck out of me, had me undressed naked. Then he starts feeling my uh, jacket to see whether I don't have anything sewn in money, because people did have that. He feels something. He takes his bayonet, strips it open, and a $5 bill and a $2 bill fall out. He takes it. He takes out his little book, puts down my number. Of course, we didn't have names. We had numbers. And he said, tomorrow you will hang on the append plots. So there's nothing I could do. Then he has me dressed, and he takes me to a well. You know those old wells? He's going to hook me on the well. He's going to hook me. put me down into the well. Right then and there, as he's trying to do it, a bunch of Nazi kids who are playing, they come over to see what goes on. So he stopped and he let me go back. And I went back to the barrack. My dad was as pale as, as a sheet. And my dad had a bottle of schnapps. 
and he gave it to me. I said, where did you take this? He said, another assessment, which I will never forget the way he looked. He looked like Mikoyan, if you remember, Khrushchev had a Mikoyan at Georgia. He looked just like a copy of him. So I assumed that he must have been a Georgian, German ethnic, you know. And he gave this to my father, and he said, I saw what happened to your son. Please give it to him. And remember, we are not all like this. That was unbelievable. Unbelievable. We went back to the barrack, and the following day, he, they didn't call me to be hanged. So that was it. The man kept the $7. He probably did not report it, and so on. Let's, let's really go to the last time you saw your father and the last words he said to you, because that is really what your book title is all about and who you are as a person, which I think everybody should be. So why don't you tell us that? That was a so-called naked parade. I was going to say that a month later, there was a naked parade. We had to undress naked, go by a SS physician, run by fast, and he took a look at you. If you could run and you were healthy, you were to stay in, the, in Krakow. If you were not, if you're a little crooked, if you had a hernia, if you had psoriasis, you go to Auschwitz. And my dad and my relative, Mr. Heller, both of them were to go to Auschwitz, and I was to stay in Krakow. We were dressing up. We didn't talk. We didn't say anything. And as we were getting dressed, my dad had a piece of bread in his pocket, and he handed it to me. And he said to me, you take it. I would not need it anymore, and I don't care to live anymore. And if I live another 10 years, all I will be doing is consuming another ton of potatoes. And others he would just be eating. I worked all my heart, um, all my life. I lost my entire family. You are the only one still alive. And I pray to God that you survive. And if you survive, promise me one thing, that you are going to be a mage. You are going to be a decent human being. I used to be stubborn. It had to be my way, and not any other way. And I promised him I will do my best, and I didn't think I will survive anyway. And then they marched them off to Auschwitz. And of course, they murdered them the same day. I was sent back to the barracks. Now, the uh, Soviets were pushing the German troops westward. And so there were mass graves in Krakow-Pwashov. So I was assigned, taken out of the Glazers and Painter Shop, in tourist mass graves. We were supposed to dig up the corpses and burn them so as not to leave any things to show the atrocities that they had committed there. And I will never forget the corpse that I was found dig. It was a redhead. There was a baby next to him. And I was afraid with the shovel to injure the corpse. So I tried to dig it deep, and I bent down to dig under the corpse. But all of a sudden, I see all the stars in the sky. A couple, a criminal couple, a German, didn't like the way I, dig, I dug, kicked me full blast in my face as I was bending down. And I had decomposed matter that he had on his boots because he just stepped on the corpses. I survived it. I was young. 
you know, and I was well preserved because I was at the air base where I could uh, get food. So then I was sent, they started moving prisoners out and shipping them to Germany, to other concentration camps and so on. And then I was assigned to a transport, which I don't know where, but there were people who used to work for Schindler in Krakow, and I, I was with them. So I hoped that maybe, I didn't know from Schindler at all, but I found out in Krakow that there is this German, you know, who is treating his workers in the Malia factory. So during your time in the Holocaust, you found yourself in Schindler's camp, and you didn't even realize that. But you were number 269 or 270 on Schindler's list. Tell us a little bit about that. I had no idea there was a list. All I knew, I found myself in a group who used to work for Schindler in Krakow. And there were two girls that also worked for Schindler that I knew from my hometown, from a village and from a small town near my hometown. I knew that they worked at Schindler's. That's all I knew, and I knew that Schindler was a man who tried to save his workers, and he had arranged for them to be transferred to Brunlitz, which in Czech called Brunlitz, where he was moving his factory to, and I was with the group, but I didn't know where I'm going. Well, we didn't go to Schindler's. We went to a concentration camp called Gross Rosen in Germany, which was the lowest Silesia. And we were there, luckily, only about a week. I don't think I would have survived if it had been there any longer. I'm not going to describe the uh, why and what. Anyway, then we were put on a train and were sent to Schindler's factory. Okay. We arrived there. I was assigned again to to Grazer shop and with a Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller was a big shot in Krakow. <laughs> he he was a scribe for the commandant in Krakow. He had been in the glass business in Krakow, so he was listed as a glazier, and I was listed as a glazier, but I was a real one. Anyway, they put us into a, a room with metal doors, and if you had gone the entire factory, you would have missed it. And that was lucky, because the Obersturmführer, Leipold, who was the head, never came in there, because he missed the metal door. But when we got in there, there was a big hole in the wall high up to the next building. So this Mr. Miller was a tall guy. He lifted me up. I peeked through that hole, and I see checks working on textiles. It was a textile factory. And this hole must have been where the uh, leather things were going through to, to this uh, place. Anyway, so we were there sort of hidden, <laughs> really. And the following day, I was there. There was a piece of bread in the hole. A few days later, there were two potatoes there. So I shared it with the two girls, and Mr. Miller shared it with his wife and son, and I had no idea that he had a wife and a daughter there. The daughter was young because the, war, the uh, prisoners resented him 
being with a family there, and no one had family there. So I found that out after the war. Yeah. Anyway, so we shared this as so with extra rations. The ration of bread was very small. It was no bigger than this. I ate it. I thought this is breakfast, but no, that was for the whole day. I learned my lesson. So I, I just kept chewing off crumbs, and the soup was beet soup. And, well, I urinated beet, beet water for a few months. If I had not known, I would have thought it was blood, but it was the beets. Anyway, Mrs. Schindler came later, and she managed to organize some extra food. She had a friend, Countess Daubeck, who owned the flour mill. And somewhere, somehow, they finagled, and we got a bigger portion of bread. And every so often, there was a piece of horse meat in, in that uh, beet soup. And whatever that. And I had no idea about the list towards the end of April where Hitler committed suicide. Many of the guards were now very old from the Volkssturm because the young were called in on the front. And Leithold was also gone. You know, so there were old guys. They were given a carpet to watch, to guard Jews. And it, <laughs> they wanted to go home. So they left. A few of them remained with us. We knew that Patton's army was to the west of us, and the Russians were to the east of us. But we were in no man's land. We didn't know where we were. Then, one morning, the guards uh, weren't there anymore. And so we just run around the place. And we see, uh, all of a sudden, we are being machine gunned from around the perimeter of the camp. And we didn't know who it was. We found out that these were actually uh, uh, Russian uh, soldiers who were taken prisoner, who were taken prisoner and joined the, uh, the Nazis. No, they were SS, and they were shooting at us. I remember I dropped on the ground because I was afraid I would be hit, and they just passed the camp and went over to the west. They, they love to go to the west because they knew there they're free. If they stayed, you know, the Russians would have gotten them. Anyway, we survived that. Then the following day, early in the morning, a young Russian soldier on a horse comes in. And we knew that we were liberated. What I'd like you to share with us now is when you immigrated to the United States, you decided to become a physician. And our medical students and our faculty and all the healthcare professionals want to hear your story about how important it was to be kind and virtuous to patients, that humanistic side of being a physician, which you were and which you became. After liberation, I was hungry for an education. I had a limited education, and I lost all these years. I would have given my arm and my leg to get an education. I went to the UNRWA, the head education department. Professor Joslin, who was professor at NYU in sociology, he was the head of the department. I went there. The medical school had been bombed. The hospitals had been bombed. Munich was to the ground. 
So, but there was an architectural school in Passing, which is a suburb of Munich, and they were going to open up the following week. I went there, get the application. I thought, well, I will learn trigonometry, a little uh, geometry. It's going to help me no matter what I end up uh, studying. I went back to the displaced persons camp, and I meet two young guys from Krakow who were in the same boat as I. Years later, I found out they were in the same barrack in Krakow that I was, which I didn't know. Both of their names was Klein. One became a psychiatrist, and one became a gynecologist. Anyway, they told me the medical school is opening up in about a couple of weeks, so they're going to wait for that. So I thought I will wait for that too. I would rather be that uh, architect. And that's what I did. I went back to Professor Jocelyn, and he gave me a form to fill out. I had to go to a physician, an American physician, who examined me to see whether I have the maturity to enter uh, the university. Then I had to go to some teachers uh, at the high school in Landsberg. They gave me a certificate that I do uh, have the maturity that used to be called a matura, uh, just like a, a high school diploma, because I had no papers. I had nothing. And I entered the medical school. Okay. And I learned very rapidly. Uh, we had pre-med first, and they had to squeeze three semesters a year because they were late in opening up. So in two years, I had six semesters. And I had physiology and biochemistry and, and uh, zoology, botany for medicals and chemistry for medical school. Chemistry I liked best. And of course, eventually, I graduated. Now, I could have come to the United States. I had a cousin who lived in Canada, and he wanted me to try to come to Montreal, to McGill University, and so on. He tried to get me in there and all that. But I had another friend from Budapest who was, I met at just Professor Jasler's office. He had already had one semester in Budapest. He was grabbed on the street of Budapest and shipped to Bergen-Belsen. So we became friends. And he came to the United States and on a scholarship, on a B'nai scholarship to Athens, Georgia. And he had to start all over again there. He sent me a letter, he said, Alex, don't come to America. You won't get an American school. No way. Finish in Munich, get a license, then you come here. And that's what I did. I kept postponing my visa until finally I was threatened. Once you came here and you started your practice, internal medicine, tell us a little bit about how you practice medicine with a sense of humanity, with a sense of being a mensch, especially with uh, your history of being in the Holocaust. I have learned one thing during the Holocaust and afterwards, that all humanity is the same everywhere. It makes no difference whether you're Jewish, Polish, Ukrainian, it makes no difference. There are the good and there are the bad. If you put them on the scale, the very good and the very bad amount only to a small percentage. So where do the 90-some percent belong to? They are the indifferent. As long as they're not the target, they don't care. And that is a tragedy, a tragedy. I wanted to be amongst the ones, the good Samaritans, 
the ones who care and care for the patient. You know. And I didn't treat tests or cardiograms. I treated human beings, no matter what the test was. And I love to treat patients. And that's how I got into clinical medicine and then took boards. And I, I had to do it as fast as possible. And I met my future wife in Chicago and she became pregnant. Now I needed some money. I was making $40 a month for $180 a year, but I can't feed a family with that. So I volunteered. So Dr. White, tell us a little bit about your uh, service. Okay, I volunteered. The Korean War was going on. And I was sent to Fort Leonard, Missouri. We were 42 physicians there because it was a huge camp. And uh, I was there for over two years. Towards the end of my service, the commander, Colonel uh, Dreisbach from Philadelphia, was probably of German origin. He was of a very German name. He called me in and he said, they need a, an instructor of medicine at the University of Missouri in Springfield. But I also had an offer in Chicago, and my wife was from Chicago. So I took the offer in Chicago and uh, as an instructor of medicine, and I was full-time. But now I have a wife, a daughter was born, and a son was born while I was in the service. So I had two kids. I couldn't live on the salary that the medical school was paying me. So I decided I will have to have a private practice. So I stayed on the faculty and I opened an office. I took over the office from a, a practitioner who wanted to become a pathologist. So he left his practice and he was a hero during World War II. He was in every newspaper. <laughs> Dr. Everick was his name. He gave me his practice. And I took it over and got extremely busy. I had lots of patients. I needed an associate because I couldn't be on call every day and every night. And then twice a week go to the medical school at Cook County Hospital where I was appointed attending physician. So I had Ward 48 and Ward 64. So what happened was I took in associates, you know, who trained at Cook County and we gradually grew. When I was retiring at the age of 75, uh, we were 14 altogether and we were different subspecialties. So Dr. White, many thanks for sharing your life with us. What, what, what would you like to tell our medical students about what it means to be a physician, what it means to be a mensch? What, what would you like them to take away and keep in their heart and in their practice of medicine as they care for and care about for patients? Well, I like them to do is or yeah, what I used to tell each one of my associates. When they, gave, when they were coming in in our group, I took them out for lunch. And I told them, if you want a, a good practice, a patient like you, you have to be available to your patients. You're providing a service. You are a physician first, and you're a specialist second. That I learned from Colonel Dreisbach, because we had psychiatrists who wouldn't take emergency call. And I remember that's what he said. In the army, you're a physician first, 
especially second. And in the army, you're on call seven days a week, and if the patient perceives that he needs help, you are there to help him. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time, your story. I can't tell you how we feel uh, as physicians, clinicians, health provi healthcare providers, sometimes inadequate because we've lost focus of what it means to take care of and care about a patient. And thank you for your insight. And it is so powerful to hear you say that the patient is first and that you're a physician first. And I think over time, uh, I, I know that our medical students are moving in that direction and they are already there. Many of them, all of our medical students are focused on the humanism side of medicine. We talk about that in our classes. Thank you for inviting me uh, because it is greatly needed. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. I hope that this was really enlightening and giving you some insight into what it means to go through a significant life story, a journey of hardship, and moving towards a journey of being a mensch, being kind and being virtuous. Thank you so much.